Welcome to the Modern Software Engineering channel. We're here today to tackle another big question. My name is Dave Farley and this is Kent Beck. Hi Kent. Hello Dave, good to see you. Good, thanks. And what's the big question for today? Today's big question is, can we write bug-free code? It's an interesting one. Would you like to start? Sure. Uh, and no, but we can get <laughs> way closer than, uh, than we're doing today. It, it, it's not even an interesting, yet it's not an interesting Boolean question because the yeah. answer is obviously no, because tractors dig up fiber optic cables and just stuff's going to happen. But the question is, can we change our assumption from, oh, there's just always going to be so many bugs that we have to deal with, you know, the, the, there's just always this weight on our back, or can we make the software so stable that we don't have that weight? Our assumption is things are going to work and we have to be prepared for the exceptions. Yeah. And there's some stuff around the edges of this question, aren't there? So, so I, I, I'd agree that the answer that I'm sure that we get, the conclusion that we should, we're both going to come to is that no, we can't write bug free code, but we can get a lot closer. And I'd also agree with what you're saying is that it's not really the right question because it's kind of starting from the assumption which I really dislike, which is that our job is to try and write perfect code. And our job is to try and prove that it's perfect in some way with tests. And tests can never do that because we can always miss a test. As you said, the world can change and invalidate our assumptions that were built into the software. So all of those things can be sources of bugs. And so I see tests from a kind of engineering perspective as a falsification mechanism. The job of a test is to show us where we're wrong, not to show us that we're right. And so we can write, we can prove that the stuff that we've tested is working. One of the surprising results of extreme programming 25 years ago was that we had many teams applying extreme programming and they'd be in organizations where your your bug tracking system was a critical piece of infrastructure because you had thousands of bugs and they were coming in faster than you could fix them and yeah. you had to you had priority one through five and then they introduced priority zero and then they introduced priority negative one because there were too many priorities like that that was the mindset you're just going to have so many bugs and many XP teams. And this was a complete surprise to me. Many XP teams would report, you know, I think we had a bug like six months ago, but not nothing since then. I mean, I'm sure there's bugs, but it's, that is that transformation from, I got to carry this, this big sack of heavy bugs with me to the, well, uh, you know, it happened six months ago. It's certain to happen again, you know, in the next six months. But day to day, we act like it doesn't happen, although we're prepared for when it does. Yeah, uh, this is one of those kind of, to use your terms, the forest and the desert things, isn't it? Because I'm fairly confident that when inhabitants of the forest, like you and I, say that, you know, in my case, when we built a financial exchange, we didn't have a bug that a user saw for 13 months and five days. And that was just normal behavior for, for those sorts of teams, in my experience. Yeah. I'm fairly confident that the people in the desert just don't believe us. But it is true. This is one of these forest and desert things where you can talk from both sides and both sides just cannot believe that the other side is possibly saying what they're saying. Yeah. Because it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And and I, I I absolutely lived that world that you were describing of having daily bug triage meetings and having all of those different levels of bugs and all of the bugs being top priority. And so and I see it in my clients still sometimes when I'm consulting. So Well, we're 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 in in this as in so many things, we are back to the bad old days before we started where yeah, the software's buggy. Mm, what are you gonna do? Well, now, now tests aren't the whole story. True. That, that's for sure. Software quality is such a hard problem that you need to solve it in a myriad of different ways. And then you get the overlapping effect of tests 
sitting together with your users, a strong social network among the programmers. I'd add observability to that so that you really understand the consequences of your decisions, a strong development culture that just has those expectations. Like you're never going to check it in without being as sure as you can that it works. So all of those things piling on top of each other is what creates this situation where the assumption is we're not going to see bugs. I'd agree entirely, but, but I, I think that the one of the paper thin differences between your view of these things and my view of these things maybe is the way that we talk about the role of tests in particularly in test driven development. I know I've said things that probably irritate you a little bit in the past in terms of saying that I think that design is the most important part of CDD. I know you think that that's deeply important as well. And you've pointed out, you've corrected me quite correctly, uh, that the testing's still important. So, so the testing matters. It's not that it's unimportant, but it's not, not the only thing. And I think that one of the things that TDD rather than just testing in general does is it drives us to design code that has some certain properties that make it testable. And as a result of that testability, those properties in themselves, modularity, cohesion, separation of concerns, abstraction, reduced coupling, all of those things combine to reduce the, the chances of bugs transiting between the different parts of the system, at least. And that tends to make for higher quality systems too. So, so, so again, you know, you can make more resilient systems that, using these sorts of techniques. What I always remember is the, the number of bugs coming out of a phase is uh, proportional to the number of bugs coming yeah. into the phase. So in a, in a waterfall-y, desert -y kind of world where you have the programmers achieve a, a plausible deniability and then they hand stuff off to the QA department, you, you don't have very many steps to your funnel. In extreme programming, you've got you have many many steps to the funnel. So you 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 lose eighty percent of the bugs, and then eighty percent, and then eighty yeah. percent, and eighty percent, and eighty percent. What comes out of the bottom is every few months, as opposed to programmer just does enough so that they can check off their box. QA does just enough so they can check off their box. You only have a couple of stages and now you're going to get yeah. hundreds of bugs, but it's not actually less work to yeah. do that. It's just fewer stages and it's, it's, uh, you know, more handoffs. So there's more opportunity to pass off responsibility, which a lot of organizations, nobody's going to say that they're trying to do that, but they sure behave that way. The other part of that, I think, is that there's some fairly decent data. So both you and I have seen. XP and continuous delivery teams achieving these very low sounding bug rates. Let's just put some numbers on that. There's a, there was a paper published a few years ago now where P Paddy Power adapted continuous delivery as part of their process, which, which essentially to my mind is, you know, XP just with the edges pushed out a little bit further. It, it well, it's that certainly inside of XP and as soon as you crank the delivery cycle down as a consequence you're going to have to adopt pretty much all of xp not n not because th that list of things is the the best way but rather just like to survive yeah. if you have 10 minute latency between programming decision and production you just have to do all the rest of xp or you're dead absolutely so 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 one of the teams that i, w I was aware of was this paddy power team and they made a big change to their development approach and they reduced their their bug count uh, in production by 95 uh, percent uh, uh, you know from the start of the year when they started introducing the practices to the end of the year when they when they were you know had an operating xp development cycle the other piece of data that i like which is from uh, some research that was published at a Usenix conference a few years ago, where they did an analysis of the causes of production failures, bugs in production. And so the, the first one that was amusing is that the commonest line of code 
uh, at the point at which a production system fails is a comment saying, should add exception handling here. But then the other thing is that the, the, other, the next commonest cause of a failure was the kind of errors that we all, we all, all us programmers put into code, off by one errors, conditionals the wrong way in a, in a statement, scope, variable scoping, all of those sorts of really common fundamental mistakes that we all make all of the time. And their conclusion was that if you eliminated those through a reasonable approach to testing, you know, test automation, then you could reduce 60% of production defects just by eliminating those common mistakes. And so, uh, as you say, if we start to think about this incrementally, we, we do a better job of that kind of testing and, uh, and, you know, TDD will help us to do that. We do a better job of driving the design. We get this compounding effect where you end up with these tiny little numbers. So it's not impossible at all. It's, it's just takes this sort of more disciplined approach. It's not just more disciplined. The, the environment in which this is taking place ha plays a huge role. So you can say, well, you should just be more disciplined. But if the people above you in the power structure are exerting pressure for you not to act in this way, you're going to not act in that way. Uh, or, you know, or it takes some kind of a perverse person, you know, uh, uh, ho horrifically insensitive to their human context, like I suppose I am, to behave in a way that's contrary to their best interests in, in the short term. So, it, it, you know, saying, oh, this is a matter of discipline is a little fing finger waggy to me. I didn't mean it in that sense. What I meant was the discipline of writing a test first, the the discipline of using continuous integration to get the feedback. That's all I meant, really. Yeah, but if, you're, if your boss says, quit wasting your time on those stupid tests, I pay you to write code. Sure. You're going to have buggier code. Sure. Yeah. Yes. That's what I mean. So, so, so the, if there are behaviors that if we, thought, if we practice these behaviors, we're going to get a better result. Yes. That's what I mean by the discipline. So that's, that's what I mean by engineering and engineering discipline. So if we do this, we're going to get a better result. And continuous integration in test room development in particular are kind of top of my list of those things. So, so, you know, part of that list of other things that you and you're talking about observability and we're getting that fast feedback, that, that, that dopamine hit every few seconds, I run my test. Oh yeah, it's all good. I run, you know, I do some more work. I run my test. It's all good. We are going to get a better result. Whoever we are, whatever we're doing, if we're doing those things, it's going to work out better. That, that's what I meant by being disciplined. So, so I did, I didn't mean bureaucratic. You know, uh, finger wag wagging. That's not what I mean. Yeah, but work out better for whom? If the if the organization isn't accounting for debugging time, it isn't accounting for unhappy customers, it isn't uh, accounting for panic weekend, which loses you two weeks of development productivity. It's just not accounting for any of those things. Then then it's not better. It's worse. And this is again forest and desert. Yeah, yeah. In the desert. It, it makes perfect sense to ignore all this stuff. And, and it doesn't look like a better outcome. Even though you and I, like we've lived it, we know that there's, a, there's another possibility out there. And uh, I think we're both astonished that people choose not to do that. But it's not like the people making those decisions are stupid. They're just making those decisions for reasons of their own. I'm starting to think that this is another big question that we should, that, <laughs> that you and I should talk a about. Ab absolutely. It may be, Maybe we're, we're wrapped on this one and we're ready to move on to the next one. What's the time? It's, we, are, we are close to time. But it's certainly, I, I think largely we're, we're agreeing so, so that there are behaviors that we, there are practices, approaches that we can adopt that mean that we don't just have to assume that lots and lots of bugs is the norm for writing software. And those practices compose. Yep. The effects compound. There's a lot of them, like four or five things that really matter. I would say I put pairing in there, you know, to, to avoid uh, off by ones. And my, my favorite bug is a sense of test, less than, greater than, whatever. You know, that's a mistake that I've been making for bleh, 50 years. And with a pair partner, I, the, the incidence of those just goes way, way down. So yeah, we have, absolutely. we have programmer tests, we have system level tests, we have pairing, we have continuous integration, 
We have the refactoring and the design for testability in the first place that reduces the possibility of tests because a lot of times the fix for a test, first there's like the less than it becomes a greater than, but then there's the thinking about is there a design that would have made this go away? That's one of the things I'm glad I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was just thinking about how could I how could I get this in? But I but I think that's important is that for me part of what I would think of as en the engineering mindset is how can this go wrong? You know th th this thing that I'm doing now wh where can this go wrong? It's one of the things that Margaret uh, Hamilton said when she kind of invented the term software engineering is that. You know, they spent an awful lot of time just worrying about how things could go wrong because people's lives depended on the software she was building. That seems important to me and certainly part of the, you know, when, when I've been working on systems, that's, that's been a function of these high, high functioning teams that I've worked on, you know, as well as being focused on testing and pairing and all of these other things, there's also a big you know, every decision we're making, we're just thinking, just questioning it a little bit and just thinking, how can that go wrong? And again, not in an expensive, time-consuming way, but it's just part of the mindset, doubting yourself. And I always think of that as deeply an engineering idea because it's like science. You know, science, science is about assuming that all our guesses are wrong. So how do we, where do we, how do we find out where they're wrong? Right. Thank you very much indeed for watching today. Uh, if you've enjoyed the episode, do hit subscribe and like. Kent and I will be back on the channel in some guise um, again soon. And we, we hope that you enjoyed it. And if you really enjoyed it, think about supporting the channel through the Patreon community. Thank you and bye-bye.